So um, Valerie Bamba is going to um, be talking um, during the latter half, and so I will pass it on to her. Um, so I'm very excited that she's doing this with me. I have to thank her because she's in the midst of moving to Houston. And so despite that, she also was very committed to being here. So thank you, Valerie. Um, and so one of the things I really want to focus on is although our research happens in a research lab, we're very interested in looking at um, children's play. Um, it's you know, it's very much when we think of play, we think of childhood, even though I strongly believe that play should be something that um, is infused throughout our lifespan. But when we think of childhood, you know, it's it's easy to find snippets of, of children engaged in play um, throughout their day. Um, play, though, is universal. It's not something that's um, restricted to humans. And in fact, it can even happen across species, right? There was new stories of polar bears um, playing with um, wolves or even Eskimo dogs. Um, although this might seem the most fantastical, right? The chess really like there's, you know, play that happens between across species just because play is so much a part of nature, right? Not just in humans. Um, you know, um, it's not unusual to see that's a puppy, a new puppy playing with the cat, right? And so play is so ubiquitous across development, not unique to humans. And there's been a lot of thought about the value that it brings to both well-being, learning, and that it really has to serve a really important function um, in species developments, right? So um, it is fun and it's just fun to watch too, right? Play is joyful. Um, and yet there's many benefits to it. And ironically, play, when people ask, what is it? It's something that we do spontaneously, right? We did not stage the puppy and the cat, right? To do this, we didn't like spend hours training them for your enjoyment. Though if you'd like to think I put in that much effort, please do so. Uh, but it's, you know, it's something that happens spontaneously. It's so enjoyable that we do it for the sake of doing it. So the fact that so many benefits come out of it makes it an especially fascinating um, context in which to understand children's development. And the talk is geared towards both looking at, um, at play, but also looking at how we can use play to understand development, and then using play as a way of leveraging um, other outcomes that we like to see in children. So um, when you look at young children, um, and that is my expertise, uh, but I think a lot of this is true throughout childhood, I got to even say into later in the lifespan, but play can happen everywhere, right? So when you're trying to bathe the baby, they're not so interested in the fact that you're trying, right, to wash their hair and so on. In fact, oftentimes a big part of bath time is having lots of toys in the tub because children are going to splash and they're going to continue to play as you're trying to meet the goal of getting them clean and hopefully into bed or during eating, right? You're trying to get children to eat, but they're often focused on um, engaging in play as they eat. And play is not limited to toys. As I'll show you in a minute, play can happen in any place with anything. In fact, oftentimes children enjoy themselves more with non-toys than they do with toys, right? But here's a few examples. So that children will engage in play with whatever and wherever they can find um, opportunities to do so. And ironically, you know, we think of, we often contrast, you know, all work and no play, right? Those are that sort of saying, I think epitomizes the fact that we think of play as very separate from work, right, as opposites. But I actually want to argue that play is um, the work of children. And in fact, there is um, a great quote by Mr. Rogers that says that play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. And I think that is the point I want to raise in this talk is that you know, we think that we have to like hand children and especially as they get older, we have to hand them worksheets. Um, we feel terrible if we don't feel like we're engaging in formal didactic interactions, right, to promote their academic outcomes. But in fact, so much learning and enrichment and discovery and motivation to learn emerges from um, opportunities to explore, learn and play. It all kind of goes hand in hand. And so when we look at infants, you know, their whole play is about discovering, exploring, um, testing things. It's the play provides opportunities for 
for learning, right? And so it actually is really important and it's all kinds of play. So here's an example of, um, this was my son at, at exactly 12 months. Um, he's now 16, a uh, lot more hair, finally. Um, is, you know, the fact that like they're playing alone but the play also happens with others and many people. And when, um, and if you were to take the view of an infant, which colleagues have done, so this is a video from a colleague, Elika Bergelson at Duke, soon to be at Harvard, um, from her seedlings project, and they filmed families in the home. So the first thing I want you to look at is look at how much stuff is around this child, right? So even though they're reading this book, the baby has a toy in its mouth, um, and there's all sorts of objects around them. And this is pretty typical in you know Western households. What you see here on this side is the view of the infant from head mounted camera. So it's not an exact because it's not you know right in between the baby's eyes, but right, but the baby's wearing a hat. So it's kind of a weird, I'll play a moment of it, but you can just get a sense of what the baby's experience is like. Blue horse, blue horse, what do you see? I see a green frog looking at me. Yeah. Green frog, green frog, what do you see? I see a purple cat looking at me. Purple cat, purple cat, what do you see? I see a white frog looking at me. White dog, white dog, what do you see? I Okay, so you can see, I mean, the baby is paying attention to the book, but they're also still picking up objects and playing and eating. And there's, and you can see it's, it's probably at a five month old, six month old level, because they still have the um, boppy pillow, right, to catch them in case they fall. And the fact that there's all these toys around shows you that these sorts of interactions are pretty short. Right. And that even though they're that the baby's doing a great job being engaged, oftentimes kids will switch from activities pretty often. Um, Here's a 12 month old. And even though they're much older, I'm going to play it much faster. You can see like, here's one, they've got one object, another object, good. And now they go and grab something else, right? And this is pretty typical, right? In interactions with babies where they are constantly, you know, going from thing to thing to thing. Um, it isn't just one single object at a time. So, um, We'll have colleagues at NYU who did a study where they went into homes and they looked at, um, they just filmed babies naturalistically for one to two hours. And they made a note of how many, what percentage of the infants in their sample. And they've done this now with a few different samples. Granted, they're all in New York City, right? But what you see is that um, on the left is a percentage of infants that they filmed. Um, and you can see that almost all of them have a book. A lot of them have stuffed animals, balls. These are pretty typical for babies. And then, you know, other toys, pull toys. And so not all babies have everything, but babies have a huge variety of toys around them. And when they're playing, they're playing with all of these going kind of jumping from thing to thing to thing, right? It's not like they get out their nesting cup and they just do the nesting cups, right? They've got all like that first video, they've got all these things around them. Um, and as they're playing with toys, they're also mixing in non-toys, right? So infants play isn't clean, right? It's mixed up. They're playing with toys as much as they're playing with non-toys. And in fact, here is a graph. So this is the frequency um, across their, like I think it's four hours. So this is why the numbers are so high. On the x-axis here on the bottom, I don't know if you guys can see if I do a pointer, good. Uh, how long babies are holding. And you can see that the largest, the highest bar, the most amount the frequency is under a minute. So when babies are picking up at 12 months, when they're picking up a toy, they're picking it up for about less than a minute and then moving on to something else. So these, you know, they're interacting 62% of their time, but it's for very short durations, right? which it still allows them to learn an immense amount. And if they're not holding anything, that's also usually for about only less than a minute, right? So it shows you that babies are getting an intense amount of input, but it's in short bursts of time, right? Babies are not sitting there staring at a single toy 
copiously studying it, mentally taking notes, right? They're switching, they're engaging, they're exploring, and then they move on to something else. Maybe they come back to it. Maybe they go on to something else. So infants' interactions with objects, you know, happens throughout their day, but in very short amounts of time, very quick bouts, which all together, though, accumulates to an immense amount of input and allows them to learn about objects. So this play, even though it seems kind of haphazard and chaotic and they're switching from thing to thing, still provides ample opportunity to learn and to learn about objects and how they function and what they're like and their shape and so on. Um, it's also true that as they play with objects, they're also learning about how these objects may interact and fit together, the relational relations between them. So here's, um, you know, this infant trying to fit this ball into a cylinder in which it actually doesn't fit, but this is pretty typical, right? Babies are trial and error. Um, you know, as they're really, as 12 month olds, if something doesn't fit, they use brute force. As you see 18 month olds and 24 month olds, they get much more strategic and they're much more planful and they've definitely developed better strategies. But this is a big part of play is just trying what works and what doesn't and manipulating objects. And it allows them also not only to learn about the objects, but about spatial relations or how objects relate to each other, like, um, and what can fit within what. Um, and in fact, there's been this whole movement about play experience and it's linked to STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. And in fact, there's a growing body of studies that show that particular types of play experiences are linked to later academic achievement, especially in math and sciences. Um, and if you don't believe me, if you log on to Amazon, here's uh, they have actually 28 of the best STEM toys for babies. So clearly by six months, if you're not practicing these toys, you're not never gonna make it um, to work for JPL, right? So, um, or NASA, right? So it's really amazing to me how the toy market has kind of been able to catch on to these sorts of research findings and kind of start to imply to parents that these are really, that particular types of play materials are especially important for children's development. Likewise, I'm really interested in kind of what parents see out there and what they're, what messages they're getting through how, to, what types of toys are sold and how they're, how they're marketed. Um, so for example, there's these play subscriptions that you toy subscriptions you can buy um i know they're they exist for pets right but they also exist for children um so one example is love every um and they offer these toy kits and so you buy a subscription and what it is is a carefully um curated um box of toys shipped at set intervals ideal to promote learning development and enjoyment and I want to draw your attention to kind of the sorts of materials that are included and think about um, the sorts of implications or messages, like what's implied about what's being important. So I guess having a, a figurine, right? So play material, like make believe um, for 11 to 12 months, but there's also a little book. Um, but here we've got some um, like a little crank in the bottom and Oops, I'm really kind of, I haven't done keynote before. And so I think I'm throwing myself because I can't see my mouse. But um, but also we see like things where you can fit in. So just like that baby trying to fit the ball into the tube, um, you can see that a lot of their toys, in fact, a high proportion include those sorts of materials, right? And that's also true for 13 and 14 month olds, things where core includes paying attention or manipulating. Um, or fitting in and same for the next set of toys. Like there's a lot that includes paying attention to the relation between how one object fits. It's almost like puzzles and so on. Um, so these toys, these toy packages also kind of have this um, type of play that you know toy marketers are talking about being important for STEM. Um, and when you look at websites and blogs, um, they often talk about spatial skills, which I will describe what it is in a moment, but, you know, they're really encouraging parents to build towers, do puzzles, but really an important part of this is that they are also encouraging families or caregivers to use particular types of language as they play. 
And to me, that's really fascinating. And I think part of what's implied in these sorts of toy kids, it's not just that the expectation is like, yes, this will keep your baby entertained. But I believe that it's also their hope is that they're going to inspire or shape the types of interactions that parents might have and the types of input or language input that parents might give to their children. So that that social component and the types of interactions are important for promoting play. So what are spatial skills? Um, spatial thinking or spatial skills includes many different types of spatial abilities. So if you think of reading a map and trying to navigate yourself, so for those of you who maybe are a more recent generation and older generations before smartphones, right? We had to use maps and figure out how to get to places. Um, there's spatial visualization. So if you've ever bought furniture from Ikea um, and noticed to your dismay that there's no uh, verbal instructions, but rather you have to interpret uh, these visual diagrams of how to fit the pieces together. That's your spatial thinking. Um, if you have to remember where did I leave my keys or you have to describe where something is to somebody else, um, you're talking about where objects are in relation to each other in space or in a particular location, right? I left the keys right on the table by the door. Um, that's all spatial information. Um, and then the mental rotation is one where it's about being able to visualize what an object would look like from mentally rotating it in your mind. And that mental rotation ability in particular is one that's one of the most strongly linked to mathematics um, and spatial skills later on in development. So it's been the one that's been of most interest. So in that, in a lot of these tasks, they ask people, you know, are these two objects um, the same or different? All right, so spatial thinking predicts math and science achievement. I mean, you can, there's studies that have shown that you can measure spatial skills in six month olds and it predicts their um, spatial and math abilities as preschoolers. There's studies that uh, measure spatial skills in preschoolers and show that it predicts, right, their math and spatial skills into um, early school age years. Um, and there's even um, studies with adults and college students showing that students who have stronger spatial skills as college students are more likely to do well um, in the STEM fields and like actually do better in their classes for a spend. So it's a big, it's been a big area of interest in trying to think about how do we promote success in this, uh, in, into the STEM fields. Um, but spatial thinking is also linked to how people talk about space. So spatial vocabulary, um, spatial language are things that refer to shapes like triangle, square, locative terms, where something is, is it in or behind, um, spatial features, it's the edge, it's small, orientation or diaxics, it's upside down, or it's here, it's there. Didactics are more um, broad. And in fact, when you measure how many spatial words kids know, um, there is a link to their spatial thinking. I mean, not surprisingly, kids who hear more spatial language have larger spatial vocabularies, right? So if you've got more exposure, it makes sense that you're going to learn these words and likely use them yourself. But if you children, and these are preschool kids with larger spatial vocabularies, actually do better on spatial tasks. And that's been something that's been shown both with toddlers, preschoolers, and even some older kids. So... Um, it, the, this link between spatial thinking and spatial vocabulary likely is bi-directional, right? They could be influencing each other's development. Um, and it did lead our research team to think about leveraging play and the fun that kids have in building and doing constructive activities um, and thinking a bit like, does it, can we use those sort of play contexts to help promote exposure to spatial language? And so we did do this one study. We've actually many studies. Um, we've replicated this with parents, um, but we look, we've manipulated how much spatial language children heard. So I'll show you a quick video. Um, we would have them doing different activities. So one example was origami um, and one group heard just general language. So that's this first child. When you see the second child, you'll hear that there's many more spatial how about we words. Put we go. How about we put this corner with this corner? Can you take this corner? You put it onto that corner. Let's match the corners. Can you match it for me? Perfect. Now I'll hold this corner and can you press down on the paper? 
Just push down. Like me. Can you do the same thing on the other side? Oops. So in retrospect, it probably wasn't the uh, most preschool friendly task, like the origami, uh, even though we really tried getting, but they did love it. And it was the best advertisement because they would come back with this pig face and then every other kid wanted to be in the study. So I learned a lot about the value of these activities, but she, she's still saying spatial words like corner, right? And that corner, right? And then like having to fold it down. So it required a lot of patience. Right. And then they would open it. And so everyone did the same activities, but it's just how much spatial language they heard differed. All right. I'm going to make it. So here's another, here's the other condition where they heard more spatial language. This right corner over to this left corner. So you can already hear one difference right and left was added right to a corner. Oh my gosh. I do not know how to use key. Oh, I'm sorry. It's really pretty, but. There we go. Left corner over to this left corner. Okay. I'm hold it down, please. You can press down on this side. Perfect. Good job. Are you sure you've never done one of these before? No. All right. Your brother has. Oh, and what shape do we make right here? Triangle. Can we open it up to make a diamond again? So you can see, like he asked, like, what shape is that? Label the triangle, open up to make a diamond. So much, much, I mean, much more spatial language. Um, and so we we had these two groups randomly assigned. And so they made this, that was the origami pig that they were making. You couldn't probably tell that from the very beginnings of it. And they did it across three different days. We did a lot of playing. Um, on two other days, they made an origami whale. Um, we did a shape matching task. Uh, we did Legos. We learned quickly to only do the Legos towards the end because very early on we did Legos as one of the first things. And a couple of boys were like, no more Legos, I'm out. So uh, we learned to save it to the very end. We got to pick, uh, we had them, they got to pick a card with patterns and made this geometric shapes. I mean, so it's like, we made it really fun and it wasn't long, right? We just, we would play with them. Each activity took maybe a couple minutes. We did a few up to about maybe 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes of play for these preschoolers. Um, here's a graph, and I try not to include a lot of graphs because I know it's 9.30 in the morning, uh, but about how much language they heard across the different activities. The blue is um, the kids who were in the spatial language group. And what we're seeing here is the proportion of words that were spatial. And so you can see that with each activity, the experimenter is saying way more proportion, way more spatial words. Um, and the red is the kids that had more of the general language. Um, so our manipulation work, we also counted how many unique words they heard. And again, in the, in the spatial language condition, which is blue, they heard many more, a higher proportion of unique spatial words. All right, so this was this was the design, right? We got these baseline measures of kids. We measured them on this, um, what's called, it's called the picture rotation task. It had 12 items. There's this upright target. They have three choices rotated at different angles from upright. Um, and children had to select which one was the same as the target on the left as the upright image. And we gave them practice. We made sure they understood the task. The correct answer could be rotated at 45 degrees, 90 degrees, um, 135 or 180. Um, and so we measured them before we did any playing with them. And here again are the two groups. At the beginning, kids were not different from each other in the two conditions. Um, what we're measuring here is percent correct. There's three choices. So chance responding is 33%. Um, I put the answers, you know, there's 12 items, but they were by, um, by angle of rotation. And when it was just 45 degree angles, kids were pretty good. Um, in fact, the play only condition kids seemed to be better than the kids in the spatial, even at the lower angles at 90 degrees, they were pretty similar to each other. But as you see, as the angles got higher, 135, 180, kids were pretty bad at it, right? It just, it got, it just gets harder, right? So as angle, and this is true with adults too. So as angle increase, angle rotation increases, people like tend to um, do worse. All right. 
So we did that. We played with them for five days and then we did the post-test. Um, and we had these two groups. Um, post-test was sometimes, typically was meant to be a couple days later. We did, we finished the study in the summer. Some people went on vacation and didn't tell us. So some, for some of the kids, it was two weeks later. So I was really scared. Like, would we see any effects? Um, but as you can tell, because it's published, we did. Um, so uh, what you can see is the kids in blue are the kids who heard the enriched spatial language. And here's how they did on the mental rotation task after the fact. And what you can see is um, the two groups are not so different at lower angles. People are doing pretty well. But when it gets really hard, the kids that heard a lot of spatial language actually did significantly better. We saw significant gains in their mental rotation, which is pretty exciting. Um, and for you data nerds out there, uh, we did a regression analysis where we looked to see, so what accounts for how well kids did at this on this post-test? Um, age, older kids do better than younger kids. Um, how well they did at first on that baseline also predicts how well they do at the end. That's not surprising. Um, when we look at how much are they hearing speech, more speech um, accounted for better performance. But then we thought we also took into account um, how many spatial words they heard. And when we added that variable to the model, age and how well the kids did at, at baseline still predicted performance. But now it was. Um, how many spatial proportion of spatial words they heard. So it wasn't, um, it was no longer just overall language, it was specifically spatial language predicted their gains, which is which is really exciting. Um, so, and when we added children's speech, that didn't account for any of their gains. It was really how much they had been exposed to. So it was exciting because we were able to use play. And this was really, I mean, believe it or not, it was a super fun study, right? We got to play. Uh, it was fun. I don't think the kids were thinking that they were doing anything to promote their spatial skills, but we got amazing gains with just, I mean, I think if you added up that input, it would probably be no more than about an hour over like weeks of play. So just like the babies, intense play all the time with objects, but it's really intense and it's really short. I also think that older kids benefit from these bouts of intense play and input, and it doesn't have to be long. I think sometimes as we can get hung up on, it's got to be a lot of input. I actually don't think it does. I think kids benefit from even short bouts of interactions and experience and enrichment from language. Um, and so it does raise this interesting cascade is as kids get better with motor skills, they can do more, they can manipulate more objects, they can do problem solving. But even as kids play, it might invite people to give them input language, right? When you hear language, it can help your learning about words. It can shape what words you're learning. So you can see how all these different domains and how play as a naturally fun context can help promote learning in, in ways that doesn't feel like learning. It's the best kind of learning. It's fun as the goal and play is just a happy side effect of, of that fun. All right, so I'm going to pass it now to Valerie, who will talk about children's drawings. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, I just finished my PhD, like Kristen um, said, with, with Dr. Casasola and transitioning into a new role um, out in Houston. Um, and my, my work and what I've really thought of that's uh, related to play is just like kind of bringing everything together and really thinking that children have all these different types of experiences in the world. They do all these types of playful activities and there's a lot of learning that's going on um, as, um, as Dr. Castella just um, uh, showed some examples of. Um, so my like questions and my interest in play is really thinking about what's going on, um, what skills are present and how is everything working together? So trying to kind of build a more holistic um, idea of um, what's happening in um, in play. And in particular today, I want to talk to you about some work that I've done specifically with children's drawings. Um, so um, because I really want to get at this idea. It was partially inspired by the pandemic. Um, um, like children play with all these different types of toys and the toys have different variations. And then if you're thinking about, oh, I want to do something playful with kids to support their learning. And then suddenly you're, you're um, faced with like 
like maybe constraints, like uh, kids have different toys at home. Like what's something everything, everyone can do um, together at the same time. And um, I feel like drawing is one of those things that every kid is able to do no matter where they are. Um, and it worked very well in an online format as well. So I'm going to um, be talking to you a little bit about what I noticed. Um, so I did a study, um, these images are from a study I, I conducted over the pandemic. It had about 124 and five-year-old children. Um, and there were different conditions, different levels of, um, we, we met with them um, once a week over a period of five weeks. And we did different types of drawing activities with them. Um, some kids receive supporting spatial language. So that would be um, like, while we were drawing with them over Zoom, they would hear like extra shape words. Some of them, we instructed them to trace images. So they had um, a little less of a motor component. And then some children, like they drew pictures like all by themselves. And then at the end, we ended up with a um, big set of different children's drawings. Um, that um, that we we we're started we we've, we've started to um, to look at um, so on the left there those two images so we had kids like draw um, uh, pictures and we told them use as many shapes as you can and then on the right we also had a prompt where we asked them like draw whatever you want to draw um, can you go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of open it up to the group um, and you can either put an answer in chat or you can raise your hand and I think I'll be able to see. Um, and so looking at these like example drawings, um, what um, I want you to like kind of, I guess, brainstorm, like what skills do you think by looking like you have big set. So this is a big challenge in developmental research sometimes is you get data, um, but the data is, is you know, it's um, it's children's behavior, it's videos of children playing, or like, like in this case, it's um, a set of uh, drawings. So um, if you were, um, I don't know, if you, if you saw this collection of drawings, what type of skills do you think you could uh, see reflected in the drawings? What might you be able to ask questions about? Emotional well-being. Okay. Yes. Um, that's that's a good one. Fine motor skills. That's good. Yes. Creativity. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, yeah. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah. So that's a lot of the ones that I thought of too. So um, yeah, you have children's drawings and there's like many different uh, skills that you can kind of see reflected in those many different types of questions that you can ask based on the same um, set of data. So that might be uh, motor skills, um, creativity. I think I see a lot of people said um, uh, spatial skills. I, I put perception on there for um, like maybe like uh, thinking about like if they're trying to draw something that they see, like maybe how well um, they see it or what how how they see it as. Um, oh, a math skill, someone said, yes, measurement estimate. Yes, butterfly, they want to be even. Good, right. So you see all these early math skills, early spatial skills um, that are there. So you see the STEM skills, then you also see things like creativity, um, motor skills. So there's a lot going on there that you can um, think about. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. And then another uh, point that I wanted to bring up is when you have um, children's drawings and you want to look at them, there's many different ways that you can look at it, that you can um, try to answer the questions that you have. So um, I have some examples up there. So you have these drawings, you might want to might want to look at the number of shapes um, that children include, the complexity, maybe the level of detail and what um, characteristics they include. Um, yes. Um, next slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then I wanted to raise this question for you. So you, we've, we've talked about children's drawing, um, how does all these different aspects going on? And so a lot of times like, oh, well in this study, and then sometimes in like real life contexts as well, like children are drawing or they're interacting in playful contexts and they're alongside like a caregiver or an educator. Um, 
And so, um, and adults have, can have a very important role in scaffolding um, children's experiences. Um, and um, yeah, so, so um, I phrase this as like, how can educators influence the experience children have while drawing? What I really mean is like, what type of guidance? Um, so this is a, another question you can go ahead and put in the chat or you can uh, raise your virtual hand if you would like. Um, so what sort of guidance um, as an educator could do you think you could provide to a child that might um, guide, like help uh, help guide their their drawing? Like what might you do if you were like with a child and they were drawing, what type of input would you provide? Good. Okay. I see some, I see some, oh, good. I see lots of answers. Yes. Uh, incorporating spatial language, give a focus or theme, drawing materials. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good one. Um, so um, children, uh, depending on what they have, like, you know, if you give them multiple colors, you give them different types of paper that might give, um, sort of guide them towards making different types of pictures than they might have otherwise, suggesting colors or shapes to use, positive observations. That's really good. Uh, creativity. Tell me about your drawing. I like that. That's like an open-ended um, question. Then you kind of get to really see what they were thinking about, why they put certain things there, what they were trying to draw. Um, yeah, good. Suggest so imagine being in a nice and quiet place. That's good to um, help them focus. I see a lot of suggestions about like themes. That's great. All right, um, next slide. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, um, you guys came up with lots of good ideas. I, I had two short ones up there and I think you said both of them. Um, so like your use of language can influence that and then the materials and guidance provided. Um, so prompt that would include like prompts and themes. Um, yeah. So that's very good. Um, next slide. Good. Yes. Um, so what, what I found in my work so far, which is still in progress, that is that like even small tweaks to like a simple activity like children's drawing, they can change how children approach the activity. And then um, by extension, like the skills that they're really targeting or developing based on that experience. Um, next, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so I did this really cool um, study. Um, in collaboration with the Ithaca Science Center and children. This was with four to seven-year-old children, and we used an iPad um, with an Apple Pencil and the app uh, Procreate. Um, if you're familiar with that, um, what it is, is it's like a, a graphic design app. So basically the child has like an iPad, it has like a blank screen, then they have a physical Apple Pencil that they can hold and it works like a normal pencil. They can draw things with it, um, but it, it it um, generates these um, digital images. So this is a really cool, um, it provides a really cool opportunity to look at children's uh, drawings and then you can use image analysis to um, really get at exactly what's happening in the drawings. Um, so I have up here some examples. Um, so what I had uh, kids do was there were different versions of um, drawing tasks that they did. So um, each time like children had um, multiple drawings, so they did a total of eight drawings. They were all of um, a house and trees. So I showed them this simple outline of a house with two trees next to it. And they had to draw in different ways. So this is um, example drawings from a four-year-old girl. And if you see towards um, the left, um, on the left side where it says draw. So she, um, they all had to uh, first like draw it by themselves. So they would just get a blank screen and they would have to copy the image. Um, and it's over towards the right side because we had a little box for them to draw the image in. Um, so they drew it and 
Um, another additional layer was sometimes when they drew it, they were able to see their drawing. And sometimes when they drew it, the drawing was invisible to them. So it had like another in, in the app, you can make different layers. So it had basically a, a white layer over top of it. So they were drawing and it was recording so that we could see it. But when they were drawing it, they were not able to see it. So you can see there the difference between um, when she had to draw the house um, without seeing it, you can see at the bot, that's the bottom row. Um, she, uh, you can see the difference in like the line quality versus when she could draw it. Um, and she was able to get that feedback from what she, um, what she could see what she was uh, drawing. So this really, um, the purpose of this study was to kind of isolate all the different components that are going on when you're drawing. So you have that visual component. So if you're copying an image, you're both, um, you need to um, register it, process it in your mind, and you need to reproduce it um, with fine motor skills. So by taking away, having it, sometimes they're able to see it when they're drawing, sometimes they're not able to see it um, we're able to see the difference in what happens if you take away that visual component. Um, then there were uh, three additional, um, I, I guess, motor, we can think of it as motor conditions. Um, so this, um, the drawings labeled mark for those ones, children were tracing. So they, they were given the outline of the house that popped up on the screen, and then they traced over it with the Apple pencil. So they either traced over right on top of the lines and they were able to see it. Um, it was visible to them or they um, traced it and they could not see it. And it was invisible. And then they had two different versions of uh, like, it was basically like connect the dots. So it was like the same outline, but like parts of the um, outline were taken away. So it was more like a connect the dots sort of um, sort of exercise. So dotted one was supposed, like there were more dots for them to connect and dotted two was a little bit harder because there were fewer dots. It was supposed to look a little bit more abstract. Um, but what's interesting here, I, I haven't, um, we're still in the process of analyzing the data, but you can kind of see um, that um, children do seem to, when, when they have more guidance, when they're able to trace, then they're able to be more accurate, even in the instances where they're not actually even able to see what it is that they're doing. So um, when they have this extra like guidance to guide their, um, their drawing, then they produce um, more, um, I guess, more images that are truer to the outline than when they're asked to draw it themselves. So you can kind of see here, like separated out, if you think about like, you know, you have the visual component, so you can see that reflected in visible versus invisible. And then you can think about a motor component. So you can see for this girl too, like her drawing when she had to draw the house um, completely on her own, how that looks different than when she had um, guidance um, to, to draw the house and trees. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so then this is a seven-year-old girl. And what you can see here, um, which is very interesting, is you can see kind of the difference. Um, so for like um, this uh, seven-year-old um, who's had more experience in school with writing and drawing, you can see sort of that the um, the uh, two draw two different versions of drawing. So when um, it was invisible versus when it was visible, they're they're more they're closer together. So you're starting to see that perhaps maybe with experience, um, children are able to um, compensate in um, in the invisible uh, condition. So like even when they're not able to see it, then they still maybe based on previous experiences with drawing are able to still produce a pretty accurate depiction of the house and trees um, compared to um, our younger kids. And so this kind of just shows, it's a good um, example to get us thinking about um, the way we structure activities, the types of guidance that we give kids. So you might want to think about like drawing, maybe in the context also of like teaching kids handwriting, um, what types of um, characteristics are you really emphasizing there for the kids? What guidance are you giving, giving them and what type of practice are they having so that they're able to succeed in all these different types of contexts? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. So I love that you did, she's doing, she does the older age group. So, you, so we got you from infancy into like seven-year-olds, right? Throughout between the two of us. Um, 
I am going to wrap it up so that we have enough time for questions. There's so much more I could have presented, but so not as to overstay our welcome and hopefully be invited back in the future to present again. Um, I will um, stop it there, but we do have so much more data on children playing in our lab with shape sorters. Valerie's published beautiful papers on just the amount of developmental change and how kids go about playing with shape sorters and puzzles. And it's amazing, right? You think of a toy that's for a six month old to a 24 month old, and even though it's the same toy, we see drastic differences and how kids play with it, their success with it, but also the strategies that they employ. And that developmental change, I think in that context of with a specific toy is really cool because you can see like what information kids use at different ages and how their whole approach can really vary as their motor skills develop, as their um, problem solving develops, right? So the the um, jam it till it gets in approach with the 12 month olds, right? Becomes much more nuanced by 20, even by 18 month olds, you see kids being much more intentional about how they try to figure out where we where to fit a shape in a shape sorter. Um, but hopefully I've given you some excitement over using play um, to study or understand children's development. Um, and also as a platform for thinking about how to promote exploration, discovery, enjoyment in a way that um, also leads to learning um, and that it offers an ideal context for introducing language or introducing other skills. And one thing that you see is blatantly missing, but is so key is a social emotional component and creativity. Um, I'm a cognitive person. But I, I work with colleagues who care about those things. And I do think that part of what makes play so enjoyable is when we can play with others, though kids also do enjoy playing by themselves. And so I think play is just a really rich avenue for thinking about making sure we, we make time for it. And even as adults, I would encourage our, ourselves to make time for play, because as we enjoy things, we'll later realize, actually, I learned something. So I realize this talk is not exactly like play, but I hope it'll inspire you to go out and do some playing. Um, and I have to thank, we have a huge research lab of about 30 undergraduates, the play and learning research team. All this work is not possible without a brigade of undergrads who help us with coding. Um, the National Science Foundation who funds our work as well as the USDA, Kim Kopko, who's been a wonderful collaborator on numerous studies that have looked at play and parenting beliefs about play. My collaborators at UC, Dave, my collaborator at UC Davis, Lisa Oaks, um, Vanessa Labou at Rutgers, um, Valerie, who's hopefully, thankfully on this talk. Um, we also have an amazing postdoc, Aaron Beckner. Um, all of this is only possible with a huge team of great people. So thank you. And I guess I should have had a slide for questions, but I forgot to add that. But I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that anyone may have. There we go. Should I stop share at this point, Kristen? Yeah, I think then we can see the, the array of folks a little more easily. And, um, and it's fine to put questions in the chat or um, raise your hand if you want to um, speak up and share one. But I see um, the first question has already arrived. Um, so Sarah Jablonski is wondering, what's the most fun research study you've conducted? Great question. Um, I think the one where we, for me, I'll let Valerie answer, but the one where we went to preschools and played with the kids, five to each kid, it was like 50 kids, five times. Um, just like, it was super, I mean, it was just like we built Legos, we did the origami um, and, it's lovely now because I look back now and these kids are almost, I mean, it took forever to do, right? So some of these kids are in middle school or early high school, right? And to have these videos of them, you know, and some of them, they're like in tutus, really, right? Or some sort of crazy outfit, right? That they, right? And that was who they were at the time. And to have been a part of that, I think is really special. We had them do a number of measures as well. And I think it gave me an appreciation for how some kids can be really strong at one type of task. And then you ask them to do something else and like they really struggle for it with it. And then other kids come in and like, right? Like that one was really easy. But and so it gave me an appreciation like every child is different and how they go about learning is really different. I think we get so fixated and like, oh, what, what are they good at already? Um, and just showing like, nope, they're all like, you know, you'll have a kid that's like, really great at something, right? But then they may really struggle with something else. So it kind of put things into perspective for me too. And just, just how powerful, like just having that 
bonding time with the kid was really fun too. I made it really, it was the most fun I ever had. Do you have an answer, Valerie? Oh yeah. I don't know that it's, it's, that's a hard question because most of them are pretty fun. Um, I really liked, um, let's see, well, my, my honors thesis back in, in undergraduate was a pretend play study. So I got to go, um, and to preschools and do like a lot of different pretend play interactions with kids. Um, that was, um, that was one of my favorites. Um, I did enjoy doing the, um, drawing study over zoom, even though it was a pandemic, um, study. And then, um, it was really great to be able to go to the science center too, and do the, um, study with the iPad. Um, and just kids were really excited about that. And, um, being able to use like drawing um, to like answer those questions. That was, um, that it was, that was really fun. Um, it, this isn't such a question, but, but a comment that Stephanie Groff put in the chat, she's pointing out that this work does show us the challenges when all of these rich environments are not available for all children. Um, it, I'm thinking, I'm reminded of that early image of the maybe 12 month old or no younger than that six month old with all the toys surrounding them. Um, and she's pointing out that you know schools see some of these um, background differences among young people arriving at school from rural kind of low income areas. I mean, I appreciate that you guys pointed out that lots of things that aren't purchased at a store are, are play items that, um, that can inspire play among young people. But um, I wonder if you wanna talk any more about variability in context um, and how that impacts what play looks like um, or what children can learn from it. Yeah, I mean, I think that I certainly fell under this this spell or this pressure to feel like I had to have like the right sort of materials in the home. Um, but I really do believe that it's not so much about the what, but rather just the opportunity to play and explore I think kids love Tupperware as much as they love magnetiles, right? Um, and there's a huge price difference, right? Magnetiles are great, right? It's one of the, you see them in a lot of preschools, but they're not that accessible because they're, they're expensive, right? Um, and so I think that it's easy to get hung up or I feel like I can't interact with my kid because we don't have this thing. And I'm like, no, no, actually, you know, that's not, that's not the barrier. Right. Of course, it makes it easier, it makes it more appealing. But I think that it does take more creativity. But I think having more open ended a bag, a marker, right? Poles, scissors. Man, my kid doesn't love playing with scissors. Uh, <laughs> right. Underguided. So I do think it part of there's Kim Kopko and I are, are doing work together. And part of what we want to do is. Um, Think about how we can create opportunities or provide ideas for families to use whatever they have in the home. A carton, carton glue, mm -hmm. um, right? Maybe things you don't necessarily want them to have unsupervised, but things that you can do without having it. Um, in working with Jen Tiffany, we've talked about that the play that we did with the Legos, and you know, Legos is another wonderful toy. Lots of hours of play also not that accessible though, right? They're, they're quite expensive and I am not getting rid of a single Lego I ever ended up like I think I feel like, right? It was a good investment, but you know, what, what other things can be? It doesn't have to be Legos, right? When you cook, you can infuse spatial language, which one's shorter, which one's longer, this one's in half, this one's right. So you can even take the same ideas and do it in the natural. And being outside, right? Creating patterns with rocks and stones, um, all of that. Um, there's a children's garden here in Ithaca. Those kids spend all day outside. Um, mm -hmm. It's really unstructured. And they do use a lot of, right? Play outside with natural materials. So I think that there is, I think it's just being able to be able to think about what you can use that you have. Kids play everywhere, regardless of what, is out there. You can have some of the best toys and they like, we'll still go play in the mud, right? Or in the puddle. It's so interesting yes, to hear you mention. It. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm against playing in puddles at this moment of life, but I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is inspiring. I have a three-year-old that I was 
seeing some yes. images that reminded me of things we've done, but I'm I'm hearing an echo of some of what um, Janet Lobach presented yesterday, the, you mentioning the children's garden, which I've been able to see here in Ithaca. Um, she was making some really interesting points about how outdoor play um, has all these opportunities for things that just exist in nature and that can be really inspiring. And, and I love your talking about how you could overlay some of this kind of learning inspired language onto that type of play. And she pointed out that lots of the outdoor spaces for young people are actually really constrained because we've built this playground that tries to direct play in very specific ways as opposed to inspiring some of the creativity um, that you're mentioning. Um, so it's cool to hear some overlap there. Um, one Another comment I'm noticing in the, in the chat is about um, and how does the average parent learn some of this? And, and you were alluding a little into work you've done with Jen Tiffany thinking about um, supporting parenting, but I, I wonder if you wanna say any more about um, kind of moving towards intervention or programming to help parents notice opportunities to infuse learning into play, um, even with simple materials. Well, I'm really interested in the point that Stephanie Graff just raised, right? That mm -hmm. there is already a program that allows, and I would love to learn more about that. Yeah, I do think that we, because I think we think of play as as um, dichotomous to work, it almost constrains the opportunities for play that do exist naturally. I think we think it's gotta be tied to certain toys or materials or it's playtime, right? Um, when in fact, I think it can happen at any point, right? So I would be, I would love to hear more about the parents as teacher. Um, uh, Mary, Mary, no, sorry. Do you, do you know, um, because I don't, this is something that's come up when, when I've taught and like just looking for videos to share with the class, but, um, there's a lot of parenting, like influencers on YouTube and tic do you know if there's anything that's developmentally or like research grounded because I feel like that I feel like I mean those get watched so I feel like that would be a good avenue for outreach would be to have something like that that is based in the research do you know if that exists no idea I can ask my daughter she's on TikTok way too much <laughs> but I'm um, not surprised wow what a great parents as teachers wow that's really cool I want to look this up well, thanks for raising that, Stephanie. I see Tony has his hand up. Yeah, I think I think that last question, um, if you want to, if you'd rather stay in that space for for a second, I think my question was it was sort of emergent after the prior sort of reflection on what counts as play, sort of uh, the the kinds of devices you'd need to really engage young people. You know, this one one reflection I had in your early video clips that you didn't you didn't really talk about, but I noticed, and I wonder if you could we could bring it into the conversation is, you know, it, it kind of struck me as somebody who studies older young people, like adolescents, that the earlier crowd, um, the camera that was placed on the 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 kid who had had to be sort of propped up a little bit, how I noticed how bouncy their world is. Like there, I mean, I it maybe maybe that doesn't track exactly with vision because it's on the top of their head, but the, their attention isn't as stabilized and focused as as you might as you might hope it to become in adolescence and then later on, and so it just get, it just made me wonder you know when you buy a toy or you hand an object to a kid to play with it, thinking they're going to interact in a very specific way, they it, it just it just makes me think that play is sort of intricately woven into the developmental capacities and motor skills of young people, and that I wonder if they're getting the same enjoyment if they can or can't focus as well, or does that matter at all? That they can, they, they may be looking around a lot of things or hard to manipulate things. Does that, does that ever inter, interact with yeah, your- Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on. I mean, so they've done studies, it's really cool where they look at um, gross motor changes. So babies that can sit independently. So you saw that kid had to be propped up, right? So he looked like he could probably kill over at any time, right? So still kind of, um, but for, you know, and there's this period between, you know, five to six months where some kids are able to sit independently 
and other kids still have to um, be propped up or they do tripod sitting where they need one arm, right? Uh, so then they only have one arm free. And what's fascinating is the kids that are able to sit independently, that means that they, um, they're actually able to hold objects with two hands and explore them mm. to a much greater degree. And then when they assess them on their understanding of objects in a separate visual looking task, they actually show more advanced um, understanding of objects as a, and so it's like, you see where these gains yeah. in motor skills matter in ways that you, we might not easily anticipate, which shows the value of having kids be outside um, or just developing their motor skills and moving around. And to, as to the question of the spatula and the pan, absolutely, right? It's not about the necessary, the materials. In fact, I think more open-ended materials that aren't constrained for one purpose, probably allow kids to play in vastly greater variety of ways. Are there other questions, comments, things folks are wondering about for our speakers? All right, well, we know how to reach them. So if something comes up, um, absolutely ping pride and we'll we'll loop you into conversation with Mary Ellen and Valerie. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you for this presentation. And um, I hope folks see some connections to work they're doing um, and perhaps like myself, some connections to work they're doing at home with their own kids. <laughs> um, 